So, welcome everybody. I'm happy that I have a full house here. Um, that's great. Uh, my name is Frank Merkötter and I will take you within the next 50 minutes on a deep dive into QML memory management internals. 50 minutes is a long time, so a little bit about the structure of my talk. I will start off with a little bit of motivation why it's interesting to look at this. Um, I will also quickly refresh some basics about memory management so we are all on the same page. And then I have two blocks looking at the, Q, at the QML side and looking at the JavaScript side, which is theory heavy. And to close off this talk, I will talk a little bit more about the tooling side to have something practical in the end. A little bit about myself. I've been a Qt developer now for quite some time. I remember Qtopia and things like this, Qt3. Uh, I'm the development lead with Basiscom, which means that I'm responsible for the technical side of our customer projects. I do system architecture, I do software architecture, and I also have an eye on the technical side of our, our customer projects. I have a, personally, I have a strong focus on all things embedded Linux. This is something close to my heart. I'm a Linux user since the mid-90s and this somehow also reflects in my, in my work. And what, what brought me here today, I am also quite interested in system programming. So some time ago, I started to dig into the internals of the QML engine to find out how it works on the inside. So why this talk? Memory management and QML is seen as something that is mostly automatic. It's convenient, it's easy to use, it's, uh, it might even eliminate certain types of errors, um, so why bother at all? Uh, this convenience has on the flip side, of course, the effect that it adds a certain intransparency and there's less control for the application developer, at least less direct control. So this can, of course, become a problem if you are developing for a resource-constrained device or if you have a really demanding application. Then it can be interesting to have a conceptual understanding how this thing works internally so you make the right decisions for your software architecture, for your system architecture. And this is also my goal for today, that we are to de together develop a conceptual understanding how this thing works. A little bit, I have to give a little bit of scope because this is a large topic which I cannot cover in, in, full, in its full length. Uh, to prepare this talk, I've used the Qt 5.5 as a reference when, I'm, when I've documented things, when I've looked at the source code. But I will, of course, point out for important changes within the Qt5 series when this change has happened. So when it can be important to know how a certain release behaves. Um, talking about releases, I won't cover Qt4 and I will also won't cover the ancient Qt5 versions. So everything before the advent of the V4 engine, which somehow marks modern times, is not covered here. Um, I implicitly assume a Linux platform. I have to streamline this talk a bit. I cannot talk about all the platforms, so I've chosen Linux. But uh, you don't have to despair. Most of the insights can be applied also to other platforms. Um, and also, this talk focuses on things directly related to memory management. It's not a general QML engine talk, so uh, for certain areas you have to expect a certain amount of hand-waving. So before we get started, I want to quickly recap some basics about memory management you find on a modern operating system, so we are all on the same page here. Basics. Um, memory management for a process on a modern operating system means virtual memory, which means the operating system is creating for each process the illusion that it's alone on the machine in its own address space. 
This address space is not contiguous, but it, is, it consists of uh, segments which are mapped. This is also what happens if you're accessing outside of such a mapped segment, you get a segmentation fault. These mappings can be created via an MMAP system call. You ask, so you're basically asking the operating system, please map me a certain amount of memory to this address. Such mappings serve a number of different roles. It, it, it will contain the text segments so of the code of your program or your libraries. It might contain the static variables of your program. It, there will be stacks and there will be heaps. And heaps we're going to cover on the next slide. Heaps is, the heap is where the dynamic allocations are served from. So this is specifically interesting when talking about the QML side of things. Um, the heap is something that is managed through a malloc implementation. This is typically part of your libc, but there are also specialized malloc implementations you can use as a drop-in if you have specialized knowledge about your application behavior. Uh, what all these have in common is that they acquire memory from the operating system, either by growing a special heap segment via the S-break system call, or by creating additional mappings to bring in more memory. This memory that has been acquired from the operating system that is kept in an internal pool. So if your application code is now causing dynamic memory allocations via new or malloc, this will be served from this pool. On the, on the flip side, if your application is releasing memory, this will be released back into the pool, not necessarily back to the operating system. Um, a malloc implementation can also try to give memory back to the OS. I say try because there are certain obstacles. Um, on the one hand, there is uh, if your program is written in C or C++, the program is aware of the address layout, so it has pointers, which can which prevent certain optimization. The malloc implementation cannot just move around memory and release blocks or something. The other thing is that a malloc implementation might be tuned towards performance, so it might it could tend to uh, hang on to memory to have it around when it's needed. It's, um, it's expensive to get memory from the operating system. So with that, we've covered basically what we need to know for the rest of the talk, and we start to look at QML and JavaScript. Some very basics you all will know. QML is a declarative language. It is used to describe user interfaces, and it's basically describing a hierarchy of UI elements and objects and their relationship. JavaScript is basically a companion that can be used, that can be embedded, and can be used to implement UI logic. And what I want to cover within the next two sections is how are these two distinct parts handled by the engine, how does the memory management work for these two, and I'm going to start with the QML side here. Again, some basics. QML object types, the base QML object types are implemented in C++. For non-visual types, this means these elements are the more uh, are derived directly from a queue object. For a visual element, they are derived from a Qt quick item. So if you have a rectangle element in your QML code, this means that there is somewhere in the back a C++ class implementing this rectangle, and here it is a Qt quick rectangle. So the QML, the source of your QML program, is basically, when seen from a certain angle, a description how to assemble and instantiate a tree of Q objects. These QML objects are allocated on the process heap, just like it would happen if you use new or malloc directly. Each of these objects has a parent, if we ignore the root for, for a moment, and this parent cannot change, at least not from 
the QML side. And also be aware that, um, or do not confuse this with the visual parent, which can change. Um, I'm going to talk about this in a second. So now you might wonder how do I create QML objects or trees of QML objects. So there's either a static side to this, where I'm basically loading in one go, instantiating a complete hierarchy of my UI elements. And um, this, of course, has some drawbacks. I mean, it's, it's simple to do, but uh, this also means that it, the loading will take a long time because all the objects have to be instantiated. And of course, there's all the memory will directly be used up. So there's a counterpart to this. You can also dynamically create object, objects. This happens either through a QML loader element or there's also JavaScript API. So you can call a Qt create component, create object. This is not uh, black or white. So typically you have a static shell of your application, which is then dynamically loading subcomponents on demand. But what all these methods have in common is that they are creating a tree of QML objects. And when such an object or part of this tree gets destroyed, it will also recursively destroy its children. This is something, a principle known from QWidget days. Um, and the interesting point so far is that there is no garbage collection involved here, at least not for the QML objects itself. These are really directly under your control deleted. So this brings me to QML properties. For the base object types, you have, um, these are, there's a C++ implementation, and these are member, member variables, basically. But if you now write in your QML source code, for example, rectangle, property and foo, property var bar, these are so-called QML-defined properties. They also need to be stored somewhere, and they also need to integrate with the rest of the meta object system. Uh, the component that takes care of this, you can directly forget the name, I just want to mention it, is the QQML VME meta object. This is a component in the QML engine which takes care of that. The important bit is, if you look into it, there are two types of properties, of QML-defined properties. There's on the one side so-called typed properties. This is basically everything that is not a var property. These are stored on the process heap also uh, within a QQML variant. And there are var properties. These are special. They are not stored on the C++ side, on the process heap, but they are rather entities of the v4 JavaScript engine and they are stored on a special JavaScript heap. I'm going to talk about this uh, later. This is, by the way, something that will change with Qt 5.6 um, as part of an effort to slim down the memory usage of properties. Um, the the one of the negative aspects of the QQML variant is that it's quite heavy. It takes uh, 32, uh, 36 bytes on a 32-bit system or 72 bytes on a 64-bit system, which is quite a bit of overhead if you just want to store an int or a bool property. Um, so this has been changed. In the future, everything will be stored as a QW4 value, which is definitely much smaller, specifically eight bytes. So what happens to properties when an object is deleted? The parts that are allocated on the process heap get deleted with the object. The parts that are stored on the JavaScript side, they are orphaned. They are just left behind for the garbage collector. We will learn later why this is the case. So now you might wonder what happens when a QML object is stored in a var property. Is this also garbage collected? The answer to this is uh, no. This will also be cleaned up via the Q object hierarchy. So, additional question, is a garbage collector ever collecting Q objects? The answer to that is yes, 
if such a queue object has JavaScript ownership, if it has no parent and no remaining JavaScript references. Um, you might wonder how this can happen. Uh, I have a short source code fragment for you <laughs> to answer that question. Um, so I'm creating a component, and from that component, I'm creating an object. And notice that there's a null parent in the create object call. Also, this is JavaScript code, which automatically gives you JavaScript ownership. And as soon as the variable r goes out of scope, there are no remaining JavaScript references. So next time the garbage collector runs, it will collect that Q object. Bonus question. Will the garbage collector ever collect a visible Q object? So are parts of UI disappearing? The answer to that is luckily no. So because a visual parent will keep its visual children alive. This is not the same as this Q object uh, parent-child relationship, it's the visual parent, but there's a special case that will cause a visual parent to keep its children alive. To demonstrate this, I have a slightly modified version of my previous fragment here. Again, I'm creating a component, I'm creating an object with a null parent, but this time I'm providing a visual parent. So there are no JavaScript references to it after we are, leave, after we are leaving the scope but there's a visual parent and this will keep this Q object alive. So um, with that, I'm going to wrap up the QML side of things. We have QML objects. They are allocated from the process heap. They are via some levels of abstraction, deallocated with delete or delete later and children of such objects are cleaned up via the cute object hierarchy. So the essence of this is that QML allows you to actually control the lifetime of your object. You are in control there. There's typically no garbage collection involved at this point. So you should make use of it in your applications. Use a dynamic loader, use dynamic object creation from the JavaScript side, to load and, of course, unload elements you are no longer needing. Um, also make sure to actually, if you're using the JavaScript API, to actually destroy the object and not just null the reference or something like this. So this brings us to the JavaScript side. Again, some basics. JavaScript and QML can be used in, in property bindings, it can be used in signal handlers, in custom methods, and of course, standalone. To make this possible, the QML engine implements something called a JavaScript host environment. This is, since Qt 5.2, the v4 engine. Before of that, it was a v8 engine. This is basically something like your web browser is doing. The web browser implements a JavaScript host environment tailored to a web browser, and the QML engine implements a host environment tailored to JavaScript, uh, to QML. So the code for the various JavaScript types, this code is implemented in C++, but instances of these types are allocated on a separate garbage collected heap and this is something we will look into detail soon. What do I mean by JavaScript type? This is something I want to clarify before going to the, the complex parts. JavaScript type can be something visible to you as a programmer in the host environment, an object, an array, date, regex, things like this. But it can be also something internal. Internal means it can be the plumbing of the JavaScript host environment, things like member data, execution context, these are just internal uh, runtime needs to be a JavaScript runtime. And there's of course the QML JavaScript integration. There are things like a QML binding wrapper, Q object wrappers. These are all also not vi directly visible to you as an application programmer, but they are instantiated behind your back. So the JavaScript heap. Uh, if you're curious, you find the implementation for that in the QV4 memory manager in the uh, QML engine source code. 
Um, so if now the runtime wants to allocate memory because it's executing your program, it will in the end call alloc data on that memory manager. And it will ask the memory manager for a certain amount of bytes of memory. If you now look into, into the implementation a bit, you will notice that there are internally 32 buckets of a fixed size, starting by 16 bytes, going up to 512 bytes. And such an allocation request will be rounded up to the next multiple of 16 and then served from a certain bucket. If you want to look at want to look this up in the literature, this is a so, it's a so-called segregated fits allocation scheme. Um, initially, all these buckets are empty. There's no memory attached to them. So if there's a request for a certain size to be served, the buckets will on demand be allocating a mapping from the operating system to serve that request. As I, as I said, memory for the buckets is not acquired through malloc, but rather to a, a platform abstraction. I guess it's inherited from WebKit times. It's the VTF page allocation, which boils down for a POSIX platform to a MAP call. If you're on a Windows system, this boils down to a virtual alloc. And this is used to acquire mappings, or memory more specifically, from the operating system to serve the needs of the JavaScript runtime. There's one exception to what I've just said. Everything larger 512 bytes is considered a special case. And is just mallocked and freed. The good thing about this segregated fits allocation is that it's quite robust against external fragmentation. So as in each bucket there are only items with the same size, there will be no fragmentation with a, in a long running program. Um, there's of course something called internal fragmentation as we are rounding up to the next multiple of 16 there's memory wasted within, but this is not getting worse over the runtime. So, how are the buckets managing their memory? Um, chunks of memory will be chopped into n-sized items. n is given by the bucket size. And they are put on a free list which is specific for a certain bucket size. Initially, this free list is empty. So when, a new, when memory is needed for a certain bucket, a new chunk will be allocated from the operating system. Or, this could also be the case, the garbage collector is triggered based on certain usage heuristics. Uh, so it will try to free up memory uh, to get items on the free list to serve a certain request. An interesting thing to note is that this memory that gets acquired from the operating system is committed memory. So this is, this, it's still empty as seen by the QML application, by your program, but it really has to be provided by the operating system because, because we have just put overlaid the free list on top of it. Also note that the only way to deallocate a JavaScript object is to run the garbage collector. There's no way to manually get rid of them. So some interesting properties about this JavaScript heap. Um, the size of G these chunks being allocated is following a growth strategy. So they start out with a uh, 64 kilobyte allocation. The next one is 128. The next one is 256. And so and so on and so on. And so with each, after each chunk is used up, the size of the next allocation will be doubled. In recent versions of, of Qt, starting with 5.3, this, uh, this series is capped at two megabytes. Earlier, version of, earlier versions of Qt would only cap at 64 megabytes. This has a quite huge potential for wasting committed memory. So, Imagine your applications needing just a few hundred kilobytes more of memory, which will drive the allocator over the cliff, causing 
32 megabytes or 64 megabytes of memory, of committed memory, to be acquired from the operating system. But this is something that has improved. Also since Qt 5.3, the exact behavior can be fine-tuned via some environment variables. There's uh, the QB4 MMM max block shift, which allows you to modify the cap of that growth. If you know for sure your application will need more memory, it's better performance-wise to tell it to cap later. And you can also set the starting point for that growth series. So you know certain things about your application, so you can start with a bigger initial chunk. So how does a garbage collector work? So the garbage collector is triggered either through an allocation, meaning Um, I'm not sure if I got your question. You said committed. Is the garbage collector... Co is the garbage collector really returning committed memory to the operating system or is he just cleaning up... Uh, I, I come to that later. I have this, okay. on, I have this on my slides. Um, so where was I? Ah, yeah. <laughs> so the garbage collector is either triggered through certain usage metrics, so it keeps tabs on your allocations, and depending on certain metrics, decides now it's the time to run. Or it can be triggered manually by you. There's a JavaScript API, and there's also a C++ API. In any case, it will run in the main thread. So this is really stop the world. While the garbage collector is running, your application is blocked. The implementation for that can also be found in the QB4 memory manager, if you're curious. Um, the scheme that is implemented there is a so-called tracing garbage collector, more specifically a mark and sweep scheme, which um, not surprisingly consists of two faces. <laughs> so phase one is a mark phase where starting from certain known routes, all objects, all reachable objects are marked. So there are certain structures, structures which contain these routes and the garbage collector, the marking part, will really walk the pointers to everything it can reach and will set a mark bit in each object it can reach. Everything that after that point has not the mark bit is considered garbage and will be deleted in, this, in the sweep phase. Uh, some side notes, the, uh, the current implementation is, is, is a non-recursive one. So there is a stack being used, which is a good thing for performance. And also, the marking scheme being implemented is a so-called exact marking scheme. Initially, with Qt before Qt 5.2, it was a so-called conservative marking scheme. Having an exact marking scheme is a good thing for future improvements on the engine. It's a, it's a precondition to implement things like a, where things can be moved. So there's a second phase, the sweep phase. In the sweep phase, there's a second algorithm which is now walking all the chunks of memory for each bucket. And if we'll check if, a, if a, it will really walk the low level data structures and we'll check if the item contained in a certain slot is in use. If it has been marked, if that's the case, the mark bit will be removed so the garbage collector can run again in the future, or if the thing is in use and not marked. In that, in that case, the object containing a certain slot will be destroyed, it will be nulled, and put back on the free list. So to answer the question from, uh, from a few minutes, um, a chunk that has been become empty during garbage collection can, after some time, there's some heuristic in place, be given back to the operating system. Um, this is a feature that is new with 5.5. Earlier ver versions of the QML engine are not able to ever get rid of a peak on the JavaScript heap, just because it cannot Due, uh, due to its ex internal structure, it cannot give memory back 
to the operating system. Um, right. So. Yes, I have a slide for that. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, this is something I just want to emphasize because I get this asked from time to time. The objectives of the garbage collector. The objective is really to free unused JavaScript object types from the JavaScript heap. It does not care about the overall memory usage in your process, about the amount of images you have, the amount of objects you have. It's really about the JavaScript side of things. Um, this can lead to some interesting behavior. I mean, it, it works as expected in some way, but this is, can lead to in interesting behavior. So there was, in versions earlier, 5.5, there was also certain behavior that um, would drive the memory usage of the host process for certain ill-defined scenarios through the roof. A QE4 string, which is a JavaScript string, is internally using QString data, the same thing that the QString is using internally. And this QString data is also allocated on the C++ side, on the C++ heap. And this has the effect that a JavaScript string would look very small to the garbage collector. Even though the, it might have quite some weight on the, on the other side, on the, on the C++ side. So in certain ill scenarios, this was le would lead to a situation where the garbage collector would not trigger and there would be a lot of memory allocated on, on the C++ side. This is something that has improved with 5.5 where the garbage collector metrics have been extended to take into account the real weight of a JavaScript string. So question, should I manually trigger the garbage collector? In general, the answer is no, because it's an expensive operation and you should, in, should leave it to the heuristics of the engine when it's the right time to run it. But as always, there are exceptions to the rule. You can, of course, if you know certain things about your application, there might be times where it is idle and nobody's looking, so that might be a good time to run the garbage collector. Or also after unloading a large QML component, it can be interesting to run the garbage collector to recover memory. If you do so, ensure to pass, after the call to destroy, ensure to pass once through the event loop before calling GC because there's some delete, ma delete later magic involved there. You will have a higher gain that way. Also, can be interesting after unloading a large QML component. This is of, malloc trim is of course highly specific to the glibc or uclibc, but there are other calls in that direction, other implementations. It can be interesting to run malloc trim or something like that after unloading a large QML component to at least encourage the malloc implementation to give memory back to the operating system. Yeah. Yes. I, I didn't get quite. Mm-hmm. Yeah. For example. So this also bring, this already brings me to the wrap up of this section. JavaScript objects are allocated on a separate JavaScript heap with the exception of large, large items, everything larger 512 bytes, and they are deallocated only via the garbage collection. There's no manual control over deallocating them. This is also true for these large items which are allocated on the process heap, they are also garbage collected. The garbage collection is either triggered through usage, uh, oops, well, I still have a picture. The recording is also off. Question? Uh, I have a question in the meantime. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> <laughs>
right? It was comp it was meant to be complementary okay. to uh, to things like calling the garbage collector. Well, let's see if, uh, if things improve. Uh, uh, I'm fine with that. That's good enough. Um, where was I? Um, all right, we were about to wrap up this section. And this was the last two sections were quite theory heavy. So um, for the closing part, I want to have a quick look on the tooling side to have something more practical. So what are questions one might want to answer? Is this still 16 to 9? This looks stretched. Oh, OK. Um, so the tooling side. Um, questions one might want to answer is, how much memory is used overall in my process? How much of this is for the QML side, for the JavaScript side, and of course, the uh, the question what caused an allocation. So let's do a quick review of the available tools. For the uh, for the overall usage, this is highly operating system specific. So this is something you need to figure out about your environment. For Linux system, this would be the the proc file system and more specifically the smaps <coughs> file, um, which contains a lot of information on that. One thing I want to emphasize is if you start measuring memory usage, you need to be you need to understand what you're actually measuring and if this if a certain unit of measurement is appropriate for your for your system. Do you have a lot of queued QML processes on your system? Are you alone in your system? Depending on the answer to that, it might be appropriate to measure the resident set size, the proportional set size, things like this. I can't go into detail there, but be sure to understand what you're measuring. So let's look at the JavaScript side first. There's a mechanism built into the QML engine. It has been there for a long time. It's called QE4MM stats, which can be triggered through an environment variable. So if you now run your QML application, it will, each time the garbage collector is run, put out some debug information on the console. And that's quite interesting information. It will tell you how long it took, how long the mark phase took, how long the sweep phase took. It will also tell you the overall amount of memory that has been acquired in the various chunks from the operating system and the amount, the number of chunks it has used for that. It will also tell you how much memory of that is currently in use. And also an interesting bit of information, if it has been, during that run, been able to release memory back to the operating system. This is this line with the released chunks. This also tells us that this uh, printout was done with a Qt 5.5. Earlier versions don't have this. Uh, what is missing from this statistics is the, uh, are the large items, everything larger, 512 bytes. These are also garbage collections. And this is something that has been added in 5.6, so then you will also see the large items in this statistic. Um, we mentioned a number of variables starting with QE4MM, so you might be tempted to grab around the Qt source code looking for more of these and stumble upon the uh, MM aggressive GC. Uh, hint from my side, this is an internal developer tool. It won't help you with your application. It will run the garbage collector for each and every allocation just to find errors more quickly, but this is not something practical for an application sitting on top. So, this is very basic. Um, what else do we have to look at the JavaScript side of things? If you're a user of the commercial version of Qt, you have a JavaScript memory profiler built into your uh, Qt creator. This, for this, you open this, uh, these, uh, how they're called, this time, these timeline tabs, and you will have additional information for memory allocation and memory usage. 
So these are two bars. The upper bar labeled memory allocation. It will visualize the memory acquired from the operating system. So these are the chunks I've talked about and these are also the large items you find there. The lower bar labeled memory usage visualizes the data, the actual usage of that data. <laughs> it will visualize the actual usage by the application. So you might notice this steep cliff over there. This is when the garbage collector was run and freed up memory. So there's more to this. Um, you can click into each of these bars and get a link back into the source code that caused this allocation. Mm. This, the problem with that is that there is often no obvious mapping between an allocation and the responsible source location in your source code. This is in some way a little bit inherent because a JavaScript run the JavaScript runtime has to allocate memory, has to allocate certain objects behind your back, things like an execution context and so on and so on. And there's, it's not clear how to map this into information that is useful for an application developer. For example, um, I've marked that image element over there. Um, the profiler tells me that it took uh, 64 bytes to create this. How do I act on this information? So this is not clear. You can use it to find hotspots, that's for sure. And where it really shines is if, we, if you combine this additional bar of information with the other information in the, in the timeline view where you have also things like animations and frame rates and things like that. They're just more interesting to know this. Also, something I want to emphasize because I was asked this a number of times, this does not show the QML side of things. This is a JavaScript profiler after all. So we now know how to get an overview about the JavaScript side. Let's look on the QML side. Um, there's a popular tool in the Linux world. It's called Valgrind and it has a plugin called Massive and there's a Massive visualizer which can create these beautiful graphs and these graphs are basically showing you allocations on the process heap and on the right side you get a, you can fold up backtraces finding the exact place when allocation was caused. Um, with this tool you can see QML objects being allocated. So I'm not sure, I, don't, I doubt that it can be read, but uh, here in this example you have something like nine megabytes of cuticle rectangles which also tells you this, that this is a synthetic test case. And, um, <laughs> but you can see object that way. There's, of course, no link back into the QML source code, of course. And also note that there is no visibility of JavaScript objects because they are allocated on a different heap, which is not served via new and malloc, with the except exceptions of large items. These will be found here. So you might wonder if you know Massive and the Massive Visualizer a bit that there is a second mode of operation where this tool is not hooking into new and malloc but rather hooking into MMAP and SBreak and things like this. So you might be tempted to start it in that mode and see if you get visibility of the JavaScript heap. Um, you can in some way you can, but I'm mostly showing this slide as a warning. Uh, <laughs> uh, so in this example, you can see that there are around 50 megabytes of allocations happening through the page allocation allocate data we've seen before. And 10 megabytes of these are Q QML binding wrappers. This is just what caused this mapping to be created. It's not necessarily what is contained there. So take this with a bit large grain of salt. So this already brings me to the wrap up of that section. For the overall mem memory, man memory management usage of your process, you need to rely on OS specific means. So this is specific to your platform. Be sure to understand what you're actually measuring. For the JavaScript side, this is, this, there you get at least on the um, 
it's, you can at least quantify the amount to a very good degree, either through the built-in mechanism, uh, through the QE4 MM stats, or through the Qt creator. For the QML memory usage, the picture is not so clear. One might be tempted to use a formula such as overall usage minus JavaScript usage is my QML memory usage. That's quite misleading, as it would count all other memory in the process towards the QML side. So what you can do in this case is to fall back again to Valgrind and Massive to find out what are the large allocations in my application and then subtract these out to get at least an idea about the QML side of things. The bad thing is there's no clear mapping between a line of code and the resulting allocation and I would even say so that this is in some way inherent as there's this abstract JavaScript and QML engine in between so it's hard to get a mapping there. This leads me to my conclusion. So, within, in the last 50, mi 50 minutes, uh, we worked on getting a conceptual understanding how QML memory management works. We've learned that on the QML side, you have a lot of control about allocation and deallocation of objects. For the JavaScript side, we've learned that there's only very indirect control you can manually trigger the garbage collector, but that's it. We also learned that the memory management has improved throughout the Qt5 series. So my advice would be to use an up-to-date version of Qt. This improvement also, also happened not only on the JavaScript side, but also on the QML side. A lot of the data structures have been slimmed down, so use an up-to-date version of Qt. If you can't, for various reasons, you should be at least aware of version-specific behavior of the QML engine. For example, you should avoid memory peak usage on the JavaScript side if you're on a version smaller 5.5. So what could this mean for a memory-constrained environment? This might sound like a non-advice, but less is more. So be sure to write slim QML code. This is especially true for delegates as things multiply there. Plan for dynamic object loading and especially also unloading. So take this into account. And of course, try to limit the amount of complex JavaScript. This is especially, again, true for delegates. And with this, I'm closing my presentation and I'm open for questions.